Years ago, many, many years ago, in fact, 1972, I was sitting at my desk at about 4.30 in the morning at the headquarters of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, arranging the information that had come in over the last 24 hours into a logical order so that we could prepare a briefing for the Admiral and his staff, which would take place later that morning. Among the papers I found on my desk was a document entitled Operation Majority, and it was not the entire paperwork involving this operation, but was merely a synopsis of the operation and projects contained under it. One of these projects was called Project Red Light. The purpose, according to this document, was to back engineer captured extraterrestrial technology for adaptation into the United States space program. Now, I have since come to believe that the extraterrestrial portion of all of this is nonsense, but that the technology is real, is real. I believe that many of us were shown these documents over the years so that later we would talk about it. I mean, how can you keep the existence of extraterrestrials if they were real? a secret. And how could anyone keep quiet knowing that they had seen documentation, official government documents labeled top secret, that expressed that these extraterrestrials were real and had visited this earth? I wanted to know just how true all of this was, and I began a program of research to find out if extraterrestrials were real. The first thing I did was collect every bit of documentation that I could find, both from the Freedom of Information Act, from the receipt search of others, from books that had been printed on the subject of UFOs, and of course through my network of friends in the intelligence community, what I discovered was amazing. What I discovered, ladies and gentlemen, is that there has been a plan in existence since about 1917, and probably before that to create an artificial extraterrestrial threat to this earth in order to create a one-world totalitarian socialist government. One of the first documents that I found in my search was this one, the Imperial Japanese Mission 1917, a record of the reception throughout the United States of the special mission headed by Viscount Ishii. And when the Imperial Japanese Mission was uh, in New York City, they had a dinner, and some pretty famous people spoke at this dinner. One of them was John Dewey. John Dewey is the father of our failing, disastrous public education system. Here's what he said. Listen very carefully. John Dewey, professor of philosophy in Columbia University, who was the next speaker, was listened to with great intentness. He said, quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. Unquote. Now, bear in mind, folks, that's 1917. One of the next documents that I found, and I found quite a few, but one that's pretty important is called a report from Iron Mountain. The probability and desirability of permanent peace. Now, I encourage you to find this book wherever you can find it. I don't know where you can get it, but find it. Page 66. Credibility, in fact, lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute for war. This is where the space race proposals, in many ways so well suited as economic substitutes for war, fall short. The most ambitious and unrealistic space project cannot of itself generate a believable external menace. It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last best hope of peace, etc., by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-our-world invasion threat. And it continues on another page. Nevertheless, an effective political substitute for war would require alternate enemies, some of which might seem equally far-fetched in the context of the current war system. It may be, for instance, that gross 
pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal substitute for war. Are you beginning to get the message, folks? Poisoning of the air and of the principal sources of food and water supply is already well advanced and at first glance would seem promising in this respect. It constitutes a threat that can be dealt with only through social organization and political power. But from present indications, it will be a generation to a generation and a half before environmental pollution, however severe, will be sufficiently menacing on a global scale to offer a possible basis for a solution. However unlikely some of the possible alternate enemies we have mentioned may seem, we must emphasize that one must be found of credible quality and magnitude if a transition to peace is ever to come about without social disintegration. It is more probable, in our judgment, that such a threat will have to be invented rather than developed from unknown conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, they have created so many alternate enemies in order to bring about their one world totalitarian socialist state that we don't know which enemy to believe is real or is false, or whether to just toss them all out on their ears. And I think that that is probably going to be the best solution. Disarmament is no accident. All of these bills in Congress to take away our weapons is no accident. The intentional environmental pollution of our lakes, rivers, streams, oceans, forests, everything is no accident, as you just heard. These things were planned many, many years ago. All the bombardment of the public with movies about flying saucers in the 50s right after the United Nations Treaty was signed and the UN Participation Act was pushed through Congress and all of the incidents since that have convinced the majority of the American people that flying saucers are real and extraterrestrials exist and that flying saucers are from an extraterrestrial origin. This is being promulgated in many ways by television commercials, in the movies, in the newspapers, by creating incidents either real or imagined. I believe, because of my research and because of the extensive documentation that I've found and that is in my book, that this whole scenario has been created to give us an artificial alien threat from outer space. During the Reagan administration, he made six speeches, specifically talked about a threat from outer space by some other species from some other planet. Six, ladies and gentlemen. Why would the president repeat the same thing six times, tagged on to the ends of speeches by him? The speechwriters did not put that in the speech. Ronald Reagan added it himself. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This was a powerful suggestion to implant into the minds of the people of the world that there really is a threat from some other species from some other planet to this Earth. Now. You people out there have been ignoring the UFO phenomenon for too long. It has all the earmarks of the most successful, most sophisticated mind control operation in the history of the world, and you are ignoring it. What better way to implement a plan to bring about a one world government than to create, create the possibility in the minds of the people of the world that we are being threatened from some other species, from some other planet, and do it in a way that if anybody questions it or challenged it or wants to talk about it publicly, that they are ridiculed. And the ultimate goal is to make the Earth look very small, to present the people of the world with an external threat to this Earth, a superior race from some other planet, vastly superior to us, in intellect, philosophy, and technology in order to cause the dissolution of nation-states, the dissolution of all existing religions, and the formation of the world totalitarian socialist government.
how can you keep the existence of extraterrestrials, if they were real, a secret? And how could anyone keep quiet knowing that they had seen documentation, official government documents, labeled top secret, that expressed that these extraterrestrials were real and had visited this Earth? I wanted to know just how true all of this was, and I began a program, according to this document, was to back-engineer captured extraterrestrial technology for adaptation into the United States space program. Now, I have since come to believe that the extraterrestrial portion of all of this is nonsense, but that the technology is real, is real. I believe that many of us were shown these documents over the years so that later we would talk about it and do a research to find out if extraterrestrials were real. The first thing I did was collect every bit of documentation that I could find, both from the Freedom of Information Act, from the receipt search of others, from books that had been printed on the subject of UFOs, and, of course, through my network of friends in the intelligence community, what I discovered was amazing. What I discovered, ladies and gentlemen, is that there has been a admiral in his staff which would take place later that morning. Among the papers I found on my desk was a document entitled Operation Majority, and it was not the entire paperwork involving this operation, but was merely a synopsis of the operation and projects contained under it. One of these projects was called Project Red Light. The purpose of Years ago, many, many years ago, in fact, 1972, I was sitting at my desk about 4.30 in the morning at the headquarters of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, arranging the information that had come in over the last 24 hours into a logical order so that we could prepare a briefing for extraterrestrial technology for adaptation into the United States space program. Now, I have since come to believe that the extraterrestrial portion of all of this is nonsense, but that this operation, but was merely a synopsis of the operation and projects contained under it. One of these projects was called Project Red Light. The purpose, according to this document, was to back-engineer captured years ago, many, many years ago, in fact, 1972, I was sitting at my desk about 4.30 in the morning at the headquarters of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States, placed later that morning. Among the papers I found on my desk was a document entitled Operation Majority, and it was not the entire paperwork involving the Pacific Fleet arranging the information that had come in over the last 24 hours into a logical order so that we could prepare a briefing for the Admiral and his staff which would take place.